Good morning. Welcome to GDC 2019. How are you all doing? Give me a big, yeah. That is a lot bigger than it's going to be in five days' time. I'm really impressed by your enthusiasm. Um, thank you so much for coming to see this talk today. It's something that's incredibly close to my heart, something that I'm exceptionally passionate about, as you all very much see over the next hour. And thank you to GDC and the Narrative Summit for allowing me to talk about this. It's something that I think is an incredibly important topic, and I'm so thrilled that we're being given the platform to actually discuss these really, really important issues with you. Um, thank you to the developers whose games I showcase in a variety of videos in this talk. Um, in particular, Corey Barlog from Santa Monica Studio, who actually kind of sat down with me and talked about Kratos from the God of War series, so I was really, really grateful for that. <laughs> My name's Dr. Jennifer Hazel. Uh, I've been a medical doctor for about eight years now. Uh, I practiced in the UK. And then I did emergency medicine in Australia, and last year I moved to New Zealand. And I've been practicing psychiatry for a few years now. It's literally the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. Um, the absolute privilege of being able to help people who are at their most vulnerable when they've been shunned and had the doors shut and rejected by the rest of society is a fulfillment that I can't possibly describe, and it brings me joy every day, which is why I'm so passionate about this. And it's also why I founded or co founded Checkpoint. Uh, we're an international non profit organization that provides resources for the mental health of the gaming community. We raise awareness, we aim to reduce stigma, which is um, a lot of what this talk is about, and we actually create and distribute mental health resources for people who are very vulnerable and in need. Um, and I just want to take a moment. We are a New Zealand um, organization, and I just want to take a very brief moment to extend my extreme regret and sorrow for what has happened in Christchurch over the last few days. Um, thank you for bearing with me while I got that out there. Um, oh, I've gone the wrong way, excuse me. Uh, I always put a content warning at the beginning of my talks. Uh, we are obviously going to be speaking about mental illness over the next hour, but that also includes themes of trauma and suicide, which is very important to specifically raise. If you actually need to get up and go, or if you need to take a break, put your headphones in, whatever you need to do, no one's going to call you out on it. You are free to do whatever you need to do to keep yourself safe. You're the most important person in the world, and your health and safety is my absolute priority, so don't feel anything negative about doing what you need to do to look after yourself. Um, also, there's some swearing in the videos. I'll try and keep my swearing to a minimum. Um, sometimes on the fly, it, you know, a little swear will slip out. But mostly, it will just be in the videos. So again, uh, not as important as the, the trigger warning, but uh, you know, something that we need to raise. And a couple of disclaimers. Please, 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 please. Please don't sue me. I don't represent anything whatsoever except for myself. Uh, and everything that I interpret with the videos and the characters in these video games we're about to see is my personal interpretation. Um, it's not anything that's been said by the developers themselves. It is literally just opinion. Um, and so we have to kind of make that clear. Um, mental illness is a legal term. Uh, so I'm going to be using the colloquialism, which is probably better described by the phrase mental health issues, because mental illness in and as itself is, um, in New Zealand, uh, defined as a disorder of cognition, volition, perception, or mood that actually impairs someone's ability to think or make decisions in a way that can keep them safe um, or keep others safe. And so they're the sorts of things we talk about in a legal term. And the lines get a bit blurry. so. I just want to put that out there. This is the colloquialism of the term mental illness. And when I am with my clients uh, at work, I tend to function in a symptom-based formulation as opposed to a diagnosis-based. So there's a kind of mixture of the two in here. And what I mean by that is um, a good example is the word psychosis. So someone can experience psychosis as part of a diagnosis of schizophrenia, so psychosis being the symptom, schizophrenia being the diagnosis, but they could also have a psychotic depression or they could have a mania with psychotic features as a part of their bipolar affective disorder. And so sometimes I'll say depression, sometimes I'll say psychosis. Um, that's not to say psychosis is the diagnosis, it's just easier for me to do it that way and also it makes it more human 
for the audience and for the, you know, the clients that, are, that I treat in my everyday life. Um, and of course, this isn't medical advice. Uh, if you're affected by anything that we talk about, please do feel free to head to checkpointorg.com slash global, where we have a variety of resources that are localized to different countries and cities all over the world. Um, we've tried to be quite thorough there, and there's also some that are worldwide resources. So, uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> There are a few spoilers in here. I have tried my absolute best to keep any spoilers to the first two hours of the game. Um, a lot of these, I reckon I get a free pass for. The Last of Us has been out for like six years. Um, you know, Life is Strange as well. Uh, God of War, I, I, there's a very, very small amount of it. It's almost all the first bit and there's no big spoilers. So I, people get sensitive about that stuff. <laughs> it's just what it was important to say. Uh, let's get started. Why is this important? Uh, I tweeted the other day that I was going to be doing this talk, and I got a response um, saying, why? why? Why are you doing this? And it wasn't because they didn't think it was important. It was because they were wondering, what's the point in representing people's pain? It's just going to make it more real for them. And I take that. Like, absolutely. I, I understand that. But there are so many reasons to learn how to do this right. Depending on where you are, where, which study you read, somewhere between 25 and 50% of people will have a mental health issue at some point in their life. That is somewhere between a quarter and half of the people in this room. It might even be more. It feels like a huge statistic to say half of us will have a mental health issue. It feels disproportionate to what we know about the people around us. If you think about the, the four closest people to you, two of them will have a mental health issue at some point in their life. And that seems baffling, and it's because we don't talk about it. And there's a reason we don't talk about it. Mental illness is extremely stigmatized. Surveys have shown that 25% of people would feel uneasy or fearful around someone with a mental illness, and 46% percent of people, excuse me, believe that a mental illness is an excuse for bad behaviour. So essentially what we're saying is that a significant proportion of the population think that half of the people in this room are badly behaved and scary. No wonder we don't want to come out and say, I've got a mental illness. No wonder people are keeping this stuff deep down. The fear of the stigma that they will be facing is huge. They're scared that they're going to not get jobs, that they're going to fail in their social lives, that people are going to actively discriminate against them. And worse still, the people in this society who suffer a mental illness are 10 times more likely to be a victim of violent crime. 10 times more likely. That's ridiculous. That's, to me, absolutely disgusting. And it needs to stop. These statistics are inherently linked to one another. The violent crime is because we view, as a society, people who are mentally ill as scary or badly behaved and therefore inhuman in some way, that they're deserving of the mistreatment that they're receiving from the rest of society. And so, of course, people aren't speaking up. Of course, that 50% statistic is a surprise. And because people don't speak up, they don't get help. Two-thirds of people will never seek medical professional help for their mental illness. Two-thirds. So you've got 50% of people have a mental illness, and two-thirds of those never get help for it, whether that's because they don't want to actually say, I'm suffering, or whether they don't even want to, like the stigma is so bad, they don't even want to acknowledge it within themselves. That's huge. We know that med pro like proper professional treatment helps, even if it's just a professional saying, you don't need pills. Here's a very brief course of self-help, like a, a self-driven CBT, or here's a social worker that can be an advocate for you. Even if it's a simple intervention, we know that we can treat mental illness. We can cure mental illness if you get professional help. So why are people scared to get help? They're scared they're going to get locked up in an asylum, that they're going to put on medication that is going to change their personality. There, there's so many things that people believe inherently. And they're scared of these things because they've seen them. They've seen them in the movies, they've seen them on TV, and they've seen them in video games. A thousand messages screaming at them constantly. If you're mentally ill, you're terrifying, and you deserve to be put in a straitjacket, locked up in an asylum, the key thrown away, and say goodbye to everything you knew. 
but it doesn't have to be that way. We know for a fact, we have studies that show that if you represent issues appropriately, empathetically, and realistically in media, public perception improves. People understand the issues better, they're more empathetic for them. That means that rates of violence decrease, respect and sympathy increase, and people are more likely to seek help. So we're talking about the most vulnerable people in our society, sometimes people that can't tell what's real and what isn't. This is how we protect them when they can't protect themselves. And it is our obligation to do that, I believe. And I assume that you agree as you are sitting here in this room. So thank you for being on this journey with me and thank you for coming because you have the power right now. And that's thrilling to me. So let's do this right. And I would be pretty terrible if I came and uh, talked to you about all this and didn't tell you how to do it. That's why we're all here. These guidelines um, were made as an adaptation of the generic screen and stage guidelines from an organization in Australia called Mindframe. They advise the media, writers, um, journalists, how to talk about and how to represent mental illness. And they didn't have a games uh, section. So with their permission, um, I took the advice that they give to film and TV, and I adapted it to make it more appropriate for game developers using what I know about game design and game development myself. And because I'm a doctor and we make acronyms out of literally everything, <laughs> have, you heard, have you heard the acronym TLA? It means three letter acronym. <laughs> so I made an acronym called LAPSES. And someone, I didn't think of this, this is not my best pun game, but someone on Twitter was like, ah, this is when your lapses in judgment are a good thing. Uh, I liked that a lot. Uh, so lapses means language. Um, I'm gonna go through these very quickly because me talking at you doesn't actually prove anything. I wanna show you some videos and that's what we're all here to see. Um, but I'll go through them very quickly to kind of just give you an overview. Language is so important. If you're the writer, and it doesn't necessarily need to be the character dialogue, it can be the narrator or even just the in-game text in any form, get the language right and avoid getting it wrong. And I know that sounds like they're the same thing, but then they're not. So we have a number of words in our everyday vocabulary that are quite loaded. Um, psycho is my least favorite word in the entire world. And if you take one thing away from this talk, never use the word psycho again, please. I will go on and on and on about this. Um, psycho literally means nothing. It could mean psychotic, it could mean psychopath. They're two different things. I will talk about that at length later. But if you use the word psycho, you're essentially labeling anyone who is having a psychosis as being a psychopath. And that is so dangerous because these people are incredibly vulnerable. Uh, crazy is another good example. I use crazy all the time. Crazy and nuts is just part of my vocabulary. I'm trying to cut them out, but it, you know, it's, I accidentally do it a lot of the time. But it comes from the word crazed, meaning out of control, meaning unpredictable. So in using that word, you're actually implying that they're traits that these people have. And words do have power. And then you've got the using words right part. And a good example for that is, oh, I'm so OCD, I like everything neat. And that's just completely trivializing the experience of someone who actually suffers with obsessive compulsive disorder because it's not just needing things neat, it's an incredibly complex illness which involves a variety of different um, obsessive intrusive thoughts and then compulsive rituals um, often in order to achieve things that are completely unrealistic. Uh, and so you, it's really important if, when you are writing to just double check the language, just literally just Google it, see what Wikipedia says. It's not something that has to be a, a real big time sink. It's just something that's really important to just double check. When language and representation is done accurately, it helps the people in the audience to identify their own vulnerabilities. So in seeing yourself or seeing a trait or a part of yourself portrayed in the game, and particularly in games, which are so immersive and so fantastically involving, you're able to, if you have this vulnerability, identify it in the character that you're playing as. 
that's a really powerful tool to promote help seeking. So if you want to represent a character's mental illness accurately, ask. Ask professionals, ask people with lived experience. Do the research, and it goes hand in hand with not perpetuating stereotypes, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Purpose. <laughs> Why are you doing it? Why are you including mental illness in your game? No one wants the 50 gazillionth horror game that's set in an asylum because someone decided one day that asylums were scary. You can and should represent mental illness. I'm not in any way saying don't do it, but there is a way to do it correctly and a way to do it for the, the right reasons. And those reasons are things like character development, making characters that are real, that you can relate to, sympathize with, that the player feels like they're actually going on a journey with because they can see parts of themselves or their friends or their loved ones in this, this, this digital person. Things like uh, driving plot motivations and conflict in the game. The person that is representing mental illness doesn't need to be perfect or a saint. Everybody makes mistakes. I was going to say the F word then. Um, and I said I wouldn't swear. Everybody makes mistakes. And a good person can do a bad thing. And that might be because they're experiencing a mental illness. The point is that you're using it for a reason to drive something. And obviously, what I would consider to be the most important reason to represent mental illness is if you're actually trying to raise awareness and reduce stigma for that mental health issue. Stereotypes tend to fall into three different trees. Um, there's stereotypes of fear and exclusion, i.e. Mental, mentally ill people are scary. Um, authoritarianism, which is mentally ill people are not able to make their own decisions and thus we must make decisions for them. Um, and ben uh, sorry, stereotypes of benevolence, uh, which is mentally ill people are childlike and must be taken care of. Be aware when you're writing Am I falling into one of these trees of the stereotype, and how can I avoid doing that? Show empathy. Uh, and it doesn't, again, it doesn't need to be someone that's a saint. You can have a good person that does bad stuff. They don't need to be 100% empathetic all the time. And maybe you could even use their mental illness or part of that as the reason that you're empathizing with them. And support is a huge one. Uh, Life is Strange did this really well. They actually had in the game a list of uh, external resources that you could go to if you were experiencing a mental health issue because those themes are used so much in the game. But it doesn't need to be as oblique as that. It doesn't need to be this big, obvious, signposted mental health stuff. Like, you know, when uh, there's a terrible story on the news and they're like, if you've been affected by this issue, you should call Lifeline. It's good to do that, and you know, please do if you want to. We've actually had a couple of games direct to Checkpoint, um, which is really cool because it's a gamer's charity. Uh, so that's something to consider. But it also could just be behavioral modeling. It could be a character who is experiencing something, and then that character says, OK, I probably need help, and then goes to get it. So you, as the developer, don't need to kind of break the fourth wall by speaking directly to the player. You can have the character or those around the character speak to the player through the game. We're going to move on to some specifics, which is the bulk of the talk, what I'll be doing for you know, roughly the next half an hour, uh, breaking down specific symptoms and conditions that are commonly associated or are mental illnesses, explaining the myths that are associated with each uh, and the reality of the situation, and then showing some video games that have done each of them particularly well uh, I actually don't go through substance abuse and addiction. Um, so I should have took that out. I apologize, because uh, the talk was too long. Depression. One of the most common mental health conditions that we as a society, society, excuse me, face. And also one that is incredibly misrepresented a lot of the time. Many people believe that depression is just feeling sad. I'm a bit down today and I might be a bit down a day next week. Actually, depression is a pervasive state of mind that can last consistently for weeks, months, or years. Someone with depression is most commonly describing to me as their doctor, not as feeling sad, but feeling nothing. And that is incredibly distressing to them. They feel apathetic, they can't enjoy anything anymore, even the things that were their best hobbies in the world, they're just like, oh, I just, just don't have fun doing this. 
They can't concentrate, their memory is short, they're not motivated, and they're not motivated to improve their situation either. And that's a really challenging thing to overcome. And the physical symptoms are almost never represented. These people usually, when they're experiencing depression, when they eat too much or not eat enough. One of the really worrying signs is when people start losing weight and they're not even trying to, it's just falling off them. They might not be able to sleep or sleep too much. And we have a very classical um, symptom of depression, which we call early morning waking, which is people that will wake up without an alarm at like 4 o'clock in the morning. And then they're like, well, what do I do with my day now? I want to bust this thing about antidepressants. I actually don't like the name antidepressants because that's not really what they're designed to do. Um, but there are a group of drugs that treat depression, therefore we call them antidepressants, um, and that they make you feel numb and they change your personality. And of course, if you believe that, you're not going to go out and try them, right? If, even if that's the one thing that's going to take you from being depressed to being functional again, if you feel like they're just not going to do anything for you and, in fact, going to harm you, you're not going to try them. But all medications have side effects. There is not a medication in the world that does not have a potential side effect. And, in fact, most people don't get any whatsoever. And if they do get one and it's not very good, you just go back to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, sorry about that, let's try this different drug instead. And it's a growing and a collaborative journey that you could take together. So that's something that, uh, again, I'll talk about drugs later, but it's something that's really important. Depression's not a sign of weakness, of course. You don't necessarily have had to experience a trauma or a negative event in your life to become depressed. You could be doing the best. You could be, as my Australian friends say, living your best life and still have an episode of depression because it's a biological illness that happens within the neurotransmitters of your brain and there's nothing that you can do about that. And it doesn't require medication to treat. You can also use psychotherapy and lifestyle treatment options. So we can't be just fitting everybody into this one thing of depressed drugs, depressed drugs. There's actually a variety of things that you can do. And so I'm just going to, and I'm desperately hoping that the sound works. So you might know in Stardew Valley that you're a farmer, and there's a number of non-playable characters in the village, and they all have an arc. You can romance and marry many of them as well. And Shane's arc, as what's indicated here, um, includes that he is suffering from what I perceive as a depressive illness. It makes him relatable, it makes him realistic as you're playing through the game. Oh. Excuse me. Um, What I'll try and do is just speak very, very quickly then, because I can't pause. So by this point in the game, you've actually built up a relationship with Shane. Um, I think this is the first meeting. And he's exhibiting some real significant symptoms. And later, you see him here surrounded by tins of beer. And you really feel for him. He's literally crying on this cliffside and encouraging you to support and help him. He's experiencing suicidal ideation. I think that's pretty clear from what's happening, which is a common feature of depression. And importantly, he asks for help. He says to the player, I really need you to take me to the hospital. Coincidentally, the doctor is another romantic choice. And I like that we're not dictating to Shane what he needs to do at this point. It's a suggestion that's appropriately labelled. I'm 
I'm so sorry. Anxiety, another incredibly common mental illness or mental health issue, I should say, that is very regularly misinterpreted. Lots of people think it's just having panic attacks or that someone who has anxiety is an emotionally uh, sensitive or shy person, when in fact anxiety disorders are real. I have one. Um, you wouldn't know it because I'm standing up here talking to hundreds of people. Um, but actually, people with anxiety disorders often overcompensate quite a lot. Um, and they will come across as extroverted, as outgoing, um, and sometimes can be a bit irritable at times. And the reason for that is that they're constantly in a state of fight or flight. Their body is telling them, you need to get out, you need to run, you need to go. And they don't have the mental capacity to actually process information at an acceptable rate. So there's about a gazillion things firing and they're not really able to kind of really see what's happening. And that's in an episode of acute anxiety. Whereas um, a lot of people who have anxiety disorders uh, go a long time without experiencing anxiety. They feel completely normal. Um, GAD, what I've written there, is generalised anxiety disorder. That's what I have, which is feeling very worried all the time about everything. There's also things like social phobia and specific phobias. And they used to include OCD and PTSD in the anxiety disorders, but they now have their own sections of the diagnostic manual. Um, interestingly, whenever I see anxiety uh, sorry, presented on screen, people are prescribed sedatives like Valium, Valium isn't going to actually take away anxiety. It will make you feel a little bit calmer for the moment, but the treatment of choice is high-dose antidepressants. Uh, this is the best thing I've ever seen. Anyone played Celeste? I want to point out that um, on the top left of the gondola is a little purple head character. That is an actual physical manifestation of the main character's mental health issues, and it's something that comes up again and again throughout the game, and is actually used as a powerful mechanic motivator, and it's a very, very emotional driven story. So obviously she's having a panic attack. He labels it immediately. The language is incredibly appropriate. It is what's happening. I also like the way that the environmental storytelling is ex explaining to you what Madeline's experiencing by showing these kind of tendrils coming into the side and the music is also communicating an experience to you without actually having to say to the player what's happening. Now, when uh, I didn't play, it was too hard for me, but um, my other half did. And when he played this and I saw this, I was like, pause this game. This is amazing. The game teaches the player how to cope with a panic attack using a breathing exercise. It includes it in the game's mechanic in an intricate way and gives the player transferable skills that can be used in their real life. That is exceptional. Amazing, amazing, amazing work. This is how you do this correctly. We're moving on to psychosis. I would like you to repeat after me. Psychosis and psychopathy are not the same thing. Thank you. Psychosis is a series of symptoms that describe a detachment from reality. People who are experiencing psychosis can have hallucinations, delusions, thought disorder, and a lack of insight. Hallucinations can be of any modality. It's not just hearing things, which is the most common, um, and it's often not seeing things either. In fact, if someone was seeing things, I would think they probably had an organic problem within their brain, such as a dementia. 
Hallucinations, as I say, can be of any modality. Often they're hearing voices, but you can hear other stuff too, explosions, music. Some people feel things under their skin, like worms uh, is the classic one. Some people smell things, poison gas is one that I hear pretty commonly. Um, and they're not able to tell that these things aren't real. Even if you challenge it, they still think it's real. And that's part of the illness itself. A delusion is different from a hallucination because a delusion is a fixed, false belief. Classic example, I'm an alien. You could put me through a CT scanner, cut off a bit of my body, dissect it and say, look, you are clearly a human being, and I still am like, no, the aliens made me look like that. That's a delusion. It's fixed, it's false, it's unshakable. Uh, thought disorder is the, the classic, um, you know, when you're thinking there's a sentence in your mind, if that sentence was to become muddled about or you were to jump very quickly from one unrelated sentence to another and you don't know this is happening, so your perception of the world around you and how you're actually thinking and processing information is impaired, uh, you obviously are not able to experience reality and make reasonable decisions about the reality that you're experiencing. And the nature of psychosis is you don't know that that's happening and you believe that what's happening to you is the true reality and that everyone else is lying, essentially. It makes it really tricky to treat, also makes these people so, so vulnerable. They are so vulnerable. They just don't know what's going on and they need looking after, they need help. They do not need to be told that they're evil, that they're psychopaths, that they are going to kill people. That is not the case at all and doing so is actively damaging these people in society and we just need to stop doing it. Uh, psychosis is not a split personality, that's a, a misnomer because the etymology of the word skits is, it means split, but it's just a coincidence and, and Latin and we're really bad at medicine at naming things accurately. Um, and the vast majority of my clients who experience psychosis live in their homes, they have jobs, they have kids and a family, and they live a very functional life, and they are not all locked up. Now, before I play this video, uh, it's a game called Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice. It is my game of the decade. Uh, these developers showed me what my patients have been experiencing over the last 11 years. Without, without me leaving my living room, I put on a headset and I played this game and I got the most overwhelming experience. I was literally in tears. I was just I can't believe that this is what it is. Uh, and it's just incredible the way that they use the sound design, the environmental storytelling, even the mechanics. Everything is unified to display what psychosis is, how it feels, what it's like. And they did it by asking doctors and people who have had psychosis. They worked closely with them and they actually represented their experiences in this game. And it is one of the most powerful experiences I've ever seen. Uh, if you didn't hear that was, are you scared? You should be scared. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You see how the, the hallucinations flipped from second to third person? That's a common experience. No, this is it. The hidden path. Often the hallucinations aren't saying anything derogatory, they're just oh, talking Sarah. about what you're doing. The darkness does not bargain. It does not reason. It is rocked. And now it has taken hold. She is such a likable character. It will spread She's strong and vulnerable at the same time. She's incredible. The seed of the soul. Until there is nothing left of her. <laughs> now, I just want to clarify very briefly what this is. This black All rock. Her suffering will have been for nothing. I believe is a delusion of nihilism, which means she believes her insides are dying. It's a common feature of psychotic depression. And not only did they put it in to 
represent her experience, they actually made it part of the game mechanic. So every time you die, the black rock grows, and if it overcomes your entire body, there's a permadeath, or allegedly, there's a permadeath mechanic. And I put this scene in as just a bit of contrast to show the various sides of this person, this character that they represented. They showed her vulnerability, her strength. They also showed her, her human side, her beauty, uh, challenging this really pervasive stereotype that psychotic people are evil by showing her experience of the world in such a glorified, wonderful way. Um, and obviously, I really like this game. Could you tell? <laughs> Uh, trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. Something experienced by many, many, many people, uh, and not just because they are war veterans. It can be any form of trauma, which can be a loss or a grief of a loved one. Um, it can also be vicarious trauma, which is you weren't even there but you've heard or seen what happened and are therefore traumatized by it. The unifying factor is there have to have been a threat to life or safety. Having PTSD is not just lacking resilience. The strongest amongst us can experience this. And there are many contributing factors that we're still trying to understand. Invalidating someone's trauma by saying that they're just weak or not resilient is incredibly damaging and stops people from being able to process and move on by sticking them in this kind of vortex of self-doubt. People with PTSD and trauma responses are not violent, unpredictable, or psychotic. They actually present with a variety of symptoms uh, that usually include hypervigilance, which is being constantly on the alert for everything around you all the time. Flashbacks of the traumatic event and nightmares, which don't necessarily need to be about the traumatic event. They could just be nightmares about anything, but they are pervasive and continuous. They might become irritable. They might become emotionally detached. I've got two games here. Do what you want. If you need to like go for the God of War bit, I understand. Now? Now. So there was a clear move here, I assume, to use environmental storytelling to communicate Kratos' experience of his past trauma. He is looking at his deceased wife right now. Not, not a glimmer of emotion on his face. The story is being told by the environment, by the music, by the relationship between him and his son. Are we hunting? You are hunting deer. Which way? in the direction of deer. This game isn't really about Kratos. Okay. It's about the relationship with his son. This way. And the reason that they're able to look at Kratos' trauma is oh. to exemplify that relationship. What are you doing? Now his guard is up. Obviously, that's a massive overreaction Only for what's fire. just happened, and this kid's mum's just died, so. Only fire when I tell you to fire. I'm sorry. Do not be sorry. Be better. Such a good line. Follow me. Why help us? Again, this is a really artful way of communicating minor Maybe I see more symptoms. of myself in you than I'm willing to admit. Maybe. Maybe by helping you, I'll make up for a lifetime of mistakes. And we're using an NPC to communicate well, Kratos' like psychology. Nope. This is a little bit of a spoiler, sorry. Cover your eyes and ears for 30 seconds if you're bothered. <clears throat> so 
So he's having flashbacks because of the lightning. Very common, big bang, big flash. Your brain goes into hyper alert mode, re-experiencing the trauma. Quick apology for this next clip. One of the uh, words comes down out of sync with the dark bit. Also, it's my favorite game of all time, just FYI. You mumble in your sleep. Experiencing nightmares, of course. I hate bad dreams. Yeah, me too. What do you want from me? Admit that you wanted to get rid of me the whole time. Tommy knows this area. Oh, fuck than... that. Well, I'm sorry. I trust him better than I trust myself. Stop with the bullshit. What are you so afraid of? That I'm gonna end up like Sam? I can't get infected. I can take care of myself. How many close calls have we had? Well, we seem to be doing all right so far. And now you'll be doing even better with Tommy. The interesting thing here is because Ellie reminds him so much of his daughter, he's literally trying to get rid of her to avoid her reliving now. his past what? trauma. Um, if you didn't know, Why Joel's daughter dies there, at the beginning of the game. Ellie. You are treading on some mighty thin ice here. There we go. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel, but I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. So yeah, this is another example of how he's not actually traumatized by the zombie apocalypse. He's Everyone traumatized by I his daughter dying. Has either died or left me. Everyone, fucking except for you. So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else because the truth is I would just be more scared. You're right. You're not my daughter. And I sure as hell ain't your dad. Literally the entire game is driven by this trauma. And we are going our separate ways. All right, one more. Borderline personality disorder. One of the most common mental health issues we see as a society. Uh, the evidence suggests that between 7 and 10% of the population has a personality disorder. And borderline is the most common personality disorder, of which there are actually 10, um, which are... I like this game. Schizotypal, schizoid, paranoid, borderline, antisocial, histrionic, narcissistic, avoidant, obsessive, compulsive, and dependent. Come on, oh, I need a round of applause for that. <laughs> As I say, borderline's really, really common. Um, it's experienced by a significant proportion of the population, and because it's poorly understood, it's misdiagnosed regularly, usually as bipolar disorder. And the reason for that is they're both characterized by mood swings, but the mood swings that are associated with borderline go like this all day, every day. And with bipolar disorder, you'll get a manic phase, which will last for several weeks, uh, and a depressive phase, which can last for several months. And in between, these people are normal, or we call normal is a terrible word. I shouldn't have said that. But they're what we say, euthymic. They're, some, they're sitting somewhere between the two mood states. Whereas a person with borderline does not experience that normalcy for very long. They're constantly going up and down. We call that affective instability. They are not super able to respond to their perceived threats in the environment. So when they think that there is a threat coming, and it's usually a threat of abandonment, 
because of an early trauma that they experienced, they react in a way that seems to others to be a bit too much. They go a bit over the top, whether that be with rage or with kind of reaching out and, and desperately requesting love and affection. Um, they don't, they're not able to regulate those big, powerful emotions as well as someone that doesn't have this disorder. And they can't help that. They, they can't control that. They don't want to be like that. It's incredibly distressing for them. And these people are the ones that I see very often because they just can't take this chaotic lifestyle anymore. And they really want to be different. They seem to often be attention-seeking um, because they occasionally will engage in things like deliberate self-harm. Uh, but actually, they're asking for help. They really, really want help. They just don't know how to ask for it because they're vulnerable. They've been early, uh, they've been traumatized early in their life and they're just not able to interact in a way that's effective or functional. It's an incredibly treatable condition and if we were better at representing it, better at diagnosing it, that more people would get the treatment that they need, they would cease their levels of distress and be able to live a normal, functional life. This is something we really need to get right. It's the oh, last video. You can't keep blaming me and everybody for everything And it's wrong Chloe with that I think has borderline so personality not disorder, not Max. I blame somebody, otherwise it's all my fault. Fuck that. So she has a very classical black or white thinking pattern here. There's no area of gray. It's either her fault or not her fault, and there's no wiggle room so there. Rachel's That's a really distressing too. way to Jesus, be. Jesus, she was banging that pig, Frank. Bitch lied to my face, Max. People are often ideated or denigrated, so that means they're either perfect or terrible. Can't anybody again. And it's held with fierce Everybody conviction. To until they don't. Even you. And you can see that Chloe is emotionally lashing out at Max because she perceived that Max abandoned her at some point, even though it wasn't her fault. Do you know what it's like fault. to wait for your father to come home when you're a kid? And he never does? No, of course not. But I was with you that day. It was just a terrible accident. And what we're showing here is that there's a reason that Chloe has this disorder. Even though she's lashing out and being quite inappropriate and hurtful towards Max, we can see that, that there's an empathetic died, reason for shit. these symptoms. And she, this is her, but without blue hair. Hard on for cameras, Max. You took a million pictures of us, and not one of them showed that you were going to leave when I needed you most. A very clear display of her frantic fear of abandonment. Fuck cameras. And they show her with such vulnerability here. Even though she's angry and all by herself, she's she somehow seems small and and, and needing of protection. She's a very, very likable, relatable character. Again, environmental storytelling. The music says more than any words could. There's some others that I really want, quickly want to go over. I actually spoke a little bit more about uh, bipolar affective disorder before, but big mood states, manic, impulsive, um, not sleeping, too much energy for weeks, normal for a bit, depressed for months. Dissociative identity disorder, excuse me, uh, used to be called split personality. Most uh, psychiatrists agree that split personality doesn't exist um, and that we call it this specific diagnosis because this different identity is a form of yourself that you're so dissociated from yourself that you're actually identifying as a different person. It's really rare. Uh, and Antisocial personality disorder. This is what psychopathy is. Uh, antisocial personality disorder is a type, subtype of personality disorder for people that uh, do not empathize with other members of society. They show very little respect for authority and don't believe that authority should apply to them. And they're hugely overrepresented in the prison population. 
Psychopaths are a version of an antisocial personality disorder where they also want to harm others. And because they don't necessarily care about others, they are much more inclined to do that. They know what they are doing. They know it is wrong. They can tell the difference between right and wrong. They are based in reality and they choose to do it anyway. That's a bad person. Someone who is psychotic does not know that what they are doing is wrong, or they do know that it's wrong, but their reality is so skewed that they can't actually tell what they're doing. And a very last slide of my very specific gripes. Stop putting wheelchairs in mental health wards. We don't need them. These people are walking around and talking, and they don't need to be in a wheelchair. Stop it. There's so many wheelchairs. There doesn't need to be wheelchairs. Asylums uh, don't exist anymore, but um, what the modern equivalent of mental health ward, they're not scary. They're really, really boring uh, most of the time. I've worked in them for years. You'd be amazed at how mundane it is. Not, uh, not, all, psychiatri not all psychiatrists are British. I'm a very bad example. <laughs> But they don't have to be evil, and they don't have to be English. In fact, some psychiatrists are really quite small and unintimidating. Please get the medication right. Talked about this heaps earlier, but all you have to do is go and Google for like five seconds, and you'll, you'll get what you need. Um, it really helps people in signposting to the appropriate treatments. Um, and yes, we still use electroconvulsive therapy. Yes, we do. Uh, regularly, it's really, really effective for certain conditions, particularly when someone's life is at imminent risk. Uh, if someone is catatonic, they're not able to move, eat, or drink, they will die in a few days. ECT works for them. We anesthetize, we give them a general anesthetic, and we use a muscle relaxant. It's not scary, it's not one flew over the cuckoo's nest. This is an effective treatment. Please stop demonising it, or obviously none of, no one here is demonising it, but please don't. Um, I think that's really important. When we represent mental illness, even talking about mental illness, it is a trigger. Even being in this room is a trigger. It might bring up stuff for you. Look after yourself. Look after each other. Have a mental health protocol in your studio. Ask a professional. Ask me. You're here because you want to do good. Thank you so much for that. You're here because you want to change people's lives. You want to save lives. You want to change the world. You are so cool. I love you. Look after yourselves and let us help you do that. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> How much time have we got for questions? A few minutes? About five minutes. Sweet, I didn't overrun. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever done that. Um, hello. Hi. Uh, I'm working on a game that focuses on the physical challenge of having a chronic illness. How can we represent the realities of some illnesses, like taking a lot of medication, without turning it into a stereotype? Sorry, could you repeat the first sentence? Okay. I'm working on a game that focuses on physical, uh, the physical challenges of having chronic illnesses, so how can we represent the realities of some of these illnesses without turning that into a stereotype? Sure, like, ask them. Um, literally ask, find the people who are experiencing what you um, are working on, talk to them, ask them. Um, obviously ask their permission. If you're struggling to find them, go to your local mental health facilities, try and ask, speak to the person that's in charge there. Um, there's usually advocacy groups who are um, very, very keen to get people involved in community service work like that. So these people really do want to talk about what they've gone through. They're fed up of seeing the same old shit on the telly representing their illness. They want it to be done right, and they're going to be so grateful that you're actually willing to take the time to listen to their story. So please, talk to them. Thank you. Uh, hi. So hi. this is hard to talk about. About... Two years ago, a friend of mine committed suicide. I'm so sorry. Thank you. And since then, I've, I've, I may not be the best person because of that to say this, but I have a really, I have really strong feelings in terms of game design of 
Never, ever, ever make your player talk somebody off the ledge because don't, do not do that. Just simply do not ever do that. I can't, I just, very, that's very, that's an extremely emotional thing for me. Mm. And for part of that, I partly to that, I want to say thank you for not citing that part of Life is Strange as being good because I personally really don't think it is. And I really also fucking hate Doki Doki Literature Club for doing the same goddamn thing, but even worse. Yeah. Um, do as a professional, what are your thoughts and feelings about that? Because last night, my friend Lou and I were talking and we sort of about these things, we kind of came to the conclusion that is a topic really we both felt is really only suitable or okay for an educational game. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I think that's fair enough. It's not something that I consider the specific scenario of, of um, and I like the way you phrased it, talking them off the ledge. Um, it's something that is an, an art that I've spent the last 11 years learning how to do. Uh, and I, 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 I would not say that I am perfect or that I really know how to do it, um, or that anyone in fact does, because sometimes we do have to put people in locked wards to, to protect them. And therefore, that means that the people around them are not going to be 100% sufficient at talking them down, because what's going on there is a process that isn't rational. It's a process that isn't going to be adherent to logic um, and so, for example, the, a good example is when someone's incredibly suicidal, if someone is genuinely considering their own life at that point, they usually feel like um, they are a burden on those who love them. They genuinely feel like they're worthless, they have no worth. And to tell them, no, you, you have worth, you're, we love you, can actually sometimes make them feel worse. So it's, it's a very difficult situation to, to try and navigate. Um, I would say that if you are going to do it in your game, um, that's a choice for the game developer, but ask people who know what they're talking about so that they can advise best practice. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi there. Um, I, I watched an interview years ago on TV that gave me the impression that anxiety and psychopathy are mutually exclusive. I was wondering, is that true? No, absolutely not. End. <laughs> anxiety, and psychopathy, uh, anxiety and psychopathy or psychosis? Psychopathy. No, I, I would say that they're, they're capable of being anxious the same as everyone else. They're just anxious about different things usually. I see. Thanks. Odd. So, yeah, interesting. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, so I thought the Hellblade's annual sacrifice was interesting that they actually brought in like professionals and patients to work on like doing it right. Um, do you know any organizations that actively work on helping mental health professionals collaborate with game developers, or the same organization? Checkpointorg.com. Okay. Um, or if there's any organizations that help do funding or grants uh, for games that are focusing on mental health. Um, the, the grants that I've seen are almost exclusively by um, health organizations. So I think uh, Ninja Theory got quite a lot of funding. Or maybe not Ninja Theory. I don't want to say the incorrect thing. I know that there was funding from a UK health organization involved. Um, so that's who I would go to. We can't help with that one, unfortunately. If you can figure out how, how that works, please let me know. <laughs> okay. Thank and you. does Checkpoint work uh, like across different nations, or is it just localized like New Zealand and Britain and stuff? Uh, no, we're an international organization. We have people on the ground in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. We have a couple of people on the ground in the US as well. Okay. Um, but because most of our work comes from digital and online interaction, it makes it much easier. There's no barriers anymore and that sort of thing. So. Cool, thank you. Get in touch. There's heaps of business cards here and flyers that have the um, summary of the lapses acronym at the front. So come and help yourselves. There's heaps, and I don't want to take them home with me. Uh, hi. Thank hi. you so much for talking to everyone about this. This is such important stuff. Thank um, you. And on the subject of Hellblade, so I love the game so much. It's so interesting, and it's so metal. But um, <laughs> there was one criticism I read from a sufferer of psychosis, which was really interesting, and talking about how they... Sometimes the voices in the game are actually helping. Yes. They'll say things like, oh no, watch out, things like that. And it was one criticism that, from this um, sufferer of psychosis, that my voices are never helpful. This sure. is not an experience. Like this, there is no upside to the things I experience. And so when you're, in, when you're making a game, 
there has to be a way to proceed. There has to be a way to get forward, usually. And so, like, have you encountered many of these examples where the kind of reality of um, the mental illnesses and sometimes the inescapable nature of them kind of conflicts with... Absolutely, the absolutely. Like, think about the people that you will meet at GDC. Everyone has an intricately different personality. Everyone is completely unique. And therefore, so are the things that affect our minds. Our, mental, our experiences of mental health are going to be completely unique to us. And if you're going to represent them in a game, you, I, I don't think it's possible to actually represent the experiences of every individual. Um, what the goal, I think, should be is to raise awareness that will reach as many as possible and reduce harm to those it doesn't reach, if that makes sense. So that finding the balance. If it's one person that said that Hellblade they didn't relate to, that's you know, that, that seems like a really sad, distressing situation for that person, that their voices are, are never, never positive, and unfortunately, it's a common one. But the people that they spoke to did have that experience, and I, I've heard that often, um, particularly with people that have schizophrenia, is sometimes their voices aren't derogatory and they're not nice. They're just literally, like, saying what you're doing. Um, like, Jenny walked to the other side of the podium. Jenny spoke to the audience. It would be so distracting and annoying to have that happen all the time. Um, but you, you, can't, you can't represent everyone's experience simultaneously. Maximise benefit, minimise harm. It's Thank you very much. The bottom line. Thank you. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, fantastic talk. Um, Thank you. In uh, God of War, um, uh, I remember, if I remember correctly, in the trailer, we had that, the same scene where um, uh, Atreus uh, shoots at the deer and uh, Kratos is saying, no, don't do that. I believe there's a, there was a game mechanic that got cut eventually where you had to control your anger. Do, do you think that it would have been uh, appropriate to, to, li to leave that in? Uh, in yeah, I think there would have been. I mean, obviously, I haven't seen it. Um, but I think that would have been appropriate and would have been powerful. I also understand the limitations of game development and sometimes you can work for four months on a feature and then have it cut um, and it doesn't make it in and that's just the way the cookie crumbles. So um, yeah, it would have been cool. And certainly when I spoke to Corey, that was actually one of the things that he he'd specifically mentioned was, was Kratos' journey of actually being able to control his impulsive rage responses um, and that had impacted the relationship with his son. Um, because he was always away trying to do that. So, yeah, it would have been interesting. Uh, it's, it's a shame. It's, it is what it is, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Just Hi. wanted to say I love your talk, and I really think Thank this is you. an important conversation to have. Thank you. I'm currently interested in making a storyline about a person who's going into people's minds and helping people with their illnesses. And I know that there are people in the world, like you say, that end up using like derogatory terms or the wrong kind of terminology for people with illnesses. And it's something that we should try to avoid in games. But I'll be honest, I actually am guilty of this myself and it's something I'm still trying to work on, but it does slip out from time to time. I'm interested in actually including it into a game, but not as to like support it, but to point out that there are people in the world that does this and it is Absolutely. something that we should condone. And I was wondering if that would be okay to include. Yeah, look, I, I, think, I think blanket censorship is ridiculous um, because you, you're not communicating... If you just censor something, you're not communicating to the people that use that language why it's inappropriate. Mm. Um, and so I think what you've just described there of, of using, using it but framing it in a way that isn't actually promoting it. So you, you can... For example, we put people that kill in our games all the time, right? Like, there's a primary mechanic, is killing other people, but we're not necessarily saying it's a good thing to do. Um, and often, the, the people who are doing that are, are quite um, demonized, and that's obviously the correct way of approaching it. So I would use that sort of analog uh, if, if it was me. But feel free to get in touch. I'd love to talk more about that, because I think that's a really interesting topic, actually. Um, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Um, any more questions? Uh, if not, thank you again so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, 
It's really tall, so I actually don't. Uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we've got flyers. I've got business cards. Uh, and we have one more question. Hey, um, I have autism. Uh, high functioning, and one of the things that I've kind of noticed with mental illnesses and gaming is that they all tend to be a lot of tragedies. And I'm like, where are the positive stories? Mm. That's my thing. I'm just kind of like, you know, a little bit, like, what the hell? I mean, all games have conflict, right? That's why they, why we play them, because we're oh, yeah. trying no, to I'm overcome not saying... the conflict. I think a good example is Celeste. There's no real tragedy there. She's trying to get to the top of a mountain, and that the whole thing is a metaphor for her journey with her mental health issues. And she actually gets to the top of the mountain, and I don't want to spoil it, but the end is amazing. So if you want to give it a Oh, go, I'm totally not you know, saying that they shouldn't have conflict. I'm just saying, why do most of them end in tragedy? Because <laughs> like, you know, with God of War. And then it's like a human condition, that, right? Yes, that's a yeah. game that's clearly about, you know, a tragic aspect and it continues to get darker and darker and darker and it doesn't really let up. I haven't finished it. <laughs> I am so sad for you. Sorry about that. No, 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 that's okay. I thought it was funny. Um, um, I, think, I think it's the human condition. We show stories about the deepest parts of our psyche and often that is tragedy. And yeah, it is tragedy, but I also see a lot of, you know, people who persevere. Mm. Interesting. I work Something actively to think about within for that sure, community, eh? so... Yeah. Eh. Don't have an answer for that, I'm afraid. We'll keep on tracking. Yeah, that's, that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, yeah, I also love the talk. I had a good time. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Sounds good, Taylor. I'll be around for a little bit.